Thank you. My company designs products. We design wearable devices and IoT devices. And one question you may have, there are lots of devices already. There's lots of wearable devices. Why would anybody need to design more of those devices? I'll give you some insight into that. So I'm going to talk first about physiological measurements that are made by wearable devices, then some of the battery limitations and what you do about them, and finally, a little bit about data security. So there are already lots of things. We've worked on many of these devices. Um, they, what they all have in common is they're measuring things about the body. So I'm going to talk about these eight different parameters. Uh, I'll go through them one at a time. And I'm going to talk about some of the advantages and some of the problems with them. So first of all, body temperature. Very straightforward. The thermometers are very simple. They've been around a long time. It's what you usually want to measure is the core body temperature. And a wearable device is on the skin. It's not the same temperature. So how do you do that? Well, if it's under the arm, you can get a very good core temperature. Or if it's on the forehead, not very many wearable devices are on the forehead or under the arm, uh, though there are a few under the arm. What you can do is use other sensors and, and, and software to figure out when to make the measurement. For example, if you've been sitting still in a cold environment, your skin is going to be much colder than your core. But if you've been moving around and you're active, you may have, the skin may be at the same temperature. However, if you've been really active and you've been sweating, again, your temperature, your skin temperature may be lower. So by knowing what activity you've done, the ambient temperature, you can, some, you can figure out certain times when you can actually measure the core temperature on the skin. So algorithms and sensor fusion are what you would use. The other thing to be careful of is the sensor needs to make good contact with the skin. Uh, if you have something on your wrist, for example, I wear my watch rather loose. And if it's loose, it may not make good contact. And if I have a temperature sensor in there, it may not even measure the skin temperature accurately. So on to motion. Uh, Fitbit started out doing motion sensors a long time ago. They're well known. Uh, they can do th step counts, obviously. There has been a lot of development in algorithms for motion sensors. So you can actually measure gait. Uh, and gait can indicate various types of illness or progression of illness. You can measure things like, are you walking or standing or sitting? And this can be a device on your wrist that's measuring whether you're sitting or uh, how, what your gait is. It's very interesting. Uh, it's not obvious how that would work, but it, it does work. You can also do dead reckoning. You can know which direction you're going and how far you're going. There's a limitation with that. The, uh, the sensors that are in your motion sensor are only accurate for a short time. The longer the time goes, the more error they have. So they very often work along with a, a uh, uh, yeah, the GPS sensor. So you can occasionally figure out where you are. And I'll explain why you would do that there due to the power later on. So algorithms are very important in making sensors work, as you can see. Heart rate is a very common measurement. It can be done several different ways. You can use ECG electrodes, and just two electrodes is all you need to measure heart rate, and they can be placed nearly anywhere on the body. Uh, another way is using the sensors in a pulse oximeter, which is infrared light that passes either through the body or is reflected. Uh, the the uh, reflected type will work almost anywhere on the body, the type that it passes through the body has to be in, where it's small, such as your finger or your ear. One other way that you can measure pulse is with the pressure. So if you put your hand on your wrist, you can measure, you can feel the change in pressure. Well, that can be picked up by a sensor as well. So let's talk a little bit more about, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the sensors that are used to measure uh, oxygen, which I talked about for pulse, uh, you can measure oxygen saturation. It uses two, uh, two uh, photodiodes, 
and two photosensors. They're different wavelengths. One is more infrared, one is closer to red. And the difference between them gives you the oxygen content, while the, the immediate change in each one is actually giving you the pulse. So the pulse is very easy to pick up. What's di difficult is to remove the pulse and actually see the oxygen. But it's been working successfully for many years. So the, the common one that's used is the, the transmissive, where it passes through the body. This is what they put on your finger when you go to the hospital. Uh, the type that is reflective, it sends a signal into your body and looks at what's returned. It, only a very small amount of light is returned. So the accuracy is much less. And at this point, the reflective type does not give you sufficient accuracy for medical uh, use unless it's calibrated. And how would you calibrate an oxygen sensor if you didn't have a transmissive type? So it's currently only good for an indication, not for medical use. Now, ECG, uh, measuring the full waveform of the heart, is quite a bit more complicated than just measuring the heart rate. Uh, for a full laboratory, they have typ typical standard would be 12 leads that you put all over your body. Not very good for a wearable device. But the, the technology has gotten to the point where with two leads, you can now get results that are just as good as a laboratory. A life core claims that they've achieved this. Now, the way it works is you have one hand on one lead and the other hand on the other lead, so it's, you know, it's well separated. If you have two electrodes on the chest, and if they're not far enough apart, you won't get a good signal. So a really small device isn't going to work. EMG is electromyogram, which is measuring the muscles. A very common application would be measuring on the wrist or on your arm, uh, being able to detect which muscles or which fingers are moving in your hand. Now, that can work very well, but if you're off by a few millimeters, you'll be on the wrong muscle. And positioning on your arm isn't easy. A professional can easily place a device on your arm, uh, but for somebody to do it day after day, it's not easy. So again, there's a significant limitation there. And EEG is measuring the electroencephalogram, the brain signals. The only way you can pick up, pick up brain signals is putting a device on the head. Uh, anywhere else in the body, you're not going to be able to do it. But there are devices that work quite well. Uh, you can have something that's a hat that you place on, and some of these devices have electrodes that actually pass sim uh, gently through the hair. Not, they're not poking you, uh, but they actually go through the hair and make a good enough connection that you can get good ECG signals without having to, to remove any hair, as in the hospital they would typically shave you before they would do that. Respiration rate is another thing that is important to measure, and the standard would be to put a strap around your chest, and you measure the, as that strap expands and contracts. Uh, that's rather inconvenient, unless you're building it into a shirt, and there are devices that you put on a shirt and you've got measurements in them, and that would work fine. But let's say you only want to put it something, a small patch on the chest. Uh, a way to do that is with thoracic impedance. You measure the, an electrical impedance measurement of the chest, and that impedance changes as your chest expands and contracts, and that successfully measures breathing rate. Now, there are people who are trying to do that with a wrist device. Putting that on your wrist, you've got your arm in fact, you need to measure it with two hands, one hand touching the wrist device. But you've got your arms in series with that measurement, and that makes it too difficult. I've, the data I've seen says that you can sometimes measure it, but not reliably. Blood pressure is something everybody would like to measure, uh, whether on the wrist or on a, a patch on the, on the chest. And it's not working very well. Obviously, the standard is a uh, device that's on your arm, or it could be a device on your wrist, that, but it has to uh, compress and measure. You know, it's a fairly large device, the one you currently can get that runs on your wrist. 
uh, compressing and, and looking at the change uh, in the sound. The, the uh, goal that people have is to measure with simply contacts on your, on your body. And pulse transit time is a way of doing that. You measure with one sensor the uh, heart rate using electrodes, and with the other sensor, you use the PPG sensor, the, the uh, photodiode. And you, you are able to see the difference in the time between when the heart beats and when the, w the pulse arrives at the wrist, if it's on your wrist, for example. Uh, and the change in that difference is related to blood pressure. Unfortunately, it's not accurate enough. So it gives you an indication, but you can't use it today for medical diagnosis, unless you calibrate it. And so in, if you do calibrate it, then it could be used. Glucose is another thing that people have spent a lot of money trying to measure non-invasively. We now have patches which are technically uh, invasive. They have microneedles on them. However, the microneedles are so small, they don't feel like needles. They, they don't hurt. So we've, come, we've got something that's very successfully measuring glucose as a patch on the body. You can also, in the last few months, in the last year, uh, they've introduced the connection between the glucose monitor and a uh, wearable pump. So you can now have a complete pancreas external to the body that's providing you the uh, closed loop. It gives you the glucose and, and measures the, the results of it. So th there's been a lot going on in that space. So let's talk a little bit about battery limitations. If you've got a wearable device, the battery is always a major limitation. It's going to limit a lot of what you can do. And the reason is that batteries are not changing very fast. If batteries had improved the way semiconductors have improved, you would get a battery the size of a pinhead that would drive your car and it would cost a penny. And as you know, we are a long, long way from that and we'll never get close to it. Uh, the reason is that, uh, well, I'll get to the reason in a moment, but so we're always working around that. And you have to deal with how long will the battery last, how often do you have to charge it, and how big is it? So chemical energy is what we're, we've got in batteries. And chemical energy storage, about the best you can get is gasoline. And I don't think we're gonna ever want gasoline in our pockets so we're going to have to live with something a little less efficient than gasoline. The, the lithium ion batteries are about one fifth of the capacity of gasoline, one fifth the, the size. So there's room to improve, but as you can see, as we've improved, we've given up something in safety. And people are working very hard to get better de energy density and at least the same uh, safety level. I expect we, we could get perhaps two times better in a number of years, but that's about it. So if we're not gonna get better batteries, what we're gonna have to get is better electronics, better electronics that uses less power. So one, one of the main uses of that battery is the transmission of the data, the wireless transmission. And there are three different ways that devices transmit data. The one that everybody likes is number one. It goes directly from that device on the body to the internet, to the cloud. That's what the cell phone does, cellular communication. Very power hungry. Uh, there are very, very few wearable devices that work that way. And even your cell phone that's got a pretty good sized battery, you charge every day. And sometimes it doesn't even last all day. So another way is a sensor going to a gateway. This is what Wi-Fi does. Uh, Wi-Fi is a gateway that is connected to the internet. When you're communicating to Wi-Fi, you're going through that gateway. Wi-Fi is a lot less than cellular, but it's still a fairly uh, power-hungry communication. So Wi-Fi is used on some wearable devices, but what's used most of the time is number three, where the sensor goes to a cell phone, and it's usually using Bluetooth LE the Bluetooth low energy. And this is low enough power that you could run it continuously 
for days or weeks, and the battery, a very small battery will be able to do it. Another consumer of power is the sensors themselves. So if you look at the first two things here, we've got a camera which is using 300 milliwatts. At 300 milliwatts, if you ran that all day, even your cell phone battery would die in less than a day. That's a lot of power. And then if you need illumination along with that, that's another perhaps 200 milliwatts. So cameras on wearable devices are not, they're, they're just not there very often. It takes a good sized battery. Stepping down an order of magnitude, GPS is still a moderate user of power at 20 milliamps, milliwatts. And a load cell, which would be used to measure that strap on, the, on your chest, for example, or in a scale, it's a moderate user of power. And the pulse oximeter is also a moderate user of power at 10 milliwatts. However, these devices don't have to run continuously. You don't have to measure your blood oxygen at a continuous. If you measure it at once an hour, you're going to get a pretty good indication. So even if it's moderate, it may be just fine for a wearable device. Now you get over here to EKG, you're down to one milliwatt. And with a nine axis motion sensor below a milliwatt, the nine axis sensor measures acceleration in three axes. It measures, uh, it has a gyroscope that works in three axes and a magnetometer in three axes. And with, with those all together, that's how you do the dead reckoning. That's the standard that's in your telephone and in a lot of devices. At that low power, you can see why it's popular. And then microphones, they vary from a tenth of a milliwatt to 10 milliwatts. That's, it depends upon what type you use, but they can be very low power. And uh, measuring light intensity is very economical. But the very lowest energy is a three-axis accelerometer, which is what was in the original Fitbit. It's such a low power that it's often used as a monitor where everything else is shut down and only the accelerometer is running. It can run continuously for a year on a, on a tiny battery. And when it senses motion, it will turn on the processor and the processor looks at some sensors and says, is there something that needs to be done? And if not, it just shuts everything down and waits again for some more motion. Now, if you're walking, you keep getting motion all the time. So some applications that works in and some it doesn't. So let's talk just a bit about data security. Uh, security, we've had several people talk about uh, security is not what you would hope it would be, but it's been since 2016 that the FDA issued guidance that requires, well, it's strongly suggested that you have security that's end-to-end. -end. That means from, the, from where the data is picked up all the way to the cloud and where it's used, you've got to have security. And security doesn't just mean that you encrypt the data and send it off. You've got to make sure that another device isn't put in there to make it look like your device. And that the, the person that is wearing that device is the person that you think should be wearing that device. And that the data is accurate and gets there at the right time. Another way that you can have a security problem. A lot of devices are updated over the air. Well, if I can update it over the air, maybe you can too with some other software. That's a big security problem. So since it's a guidance, this isn't something that's optional. This is something that if you don't have, you can have a real problem if you get a security breach. So it's no longer optional, but I don't see it becoming as uh, big a deal as it I think it should be, but uh, the large companies are definitely worried about it. There are some companies that offer third-party products that do make the security easier to implement. So SecureRF has an algorithm that runs on a very small processor to do encryption. Encryption typically takes a fairly powerful processor, but now you don't have to do that. You don't, you don't need a large processor that uses a lot of power. Intrinsic ID has uh, technology that generates a key 
in the device that's just based on, on the, uh, the way the device works, the way the, the RAM powers up. So you no longer have to place a key into a device. Uh, one problem with security would be if you manufacture a device in China and you put the secret key into the device where it's being manufactured, you can see there may be a, a possibility of a breach of your security. Well, if it's built into the device and you don't have to put it in at manufacturing, that overcomes that problem. And then Secure Push has a system that works all the way from the chip to the mobile phone and to the cloud. So you don't have to develop security all the way from scratch. You, you've got a lot of companies providing services to help out. So gives you a little idea of why with all these issues, one particular device isn't going to solve a lot of applications. You need different devices for different applications. Any questions? Thank you, Walter. That was, uh, that was great. I have a question really about the glucose monitor. Uh, it, is that truly mobile device or what are, because I know that there's a couple devices out there that claim they can track glucose and really what it is is trending. So I'm, I'm not familiar except maybe Dexcom maybe? But yeah, Dexcom is one. There's several companies that have patches. They're, they're worn on the abdomen. Now, I left out one important point. Those patches need calibration once or twice a day. You still have to stick your finger and, and make okay. that measurement. They're not good enough to go without that calibration. All right, so there isn't one that is totally non... Totally non-invasive, not one okay. yet, no. I didn't think so, thanks. <laughs> Anyone else? Please give a round of applause to Walter. Applause.